Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources, and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. <laughs> Craig just unplugged himself from the- <laughs> I, I thought I plugged directly in. Oh, friends, uh, welcome to the Ransom Tart Podcast. It, it's not always as polished as I know we sound in our professional studio way. You know, we really had to get a visual of this. We have a table, and uh, it has an, a moving blanket on top of it, one of those padded blankets. for That's our sound uh, proofing. And the walls do have some soundboard on them, but they also have a lot of other stuff. And um, Actually, those are... Ceiling whoa, tiles. Whoa, whoa, Father Time steps in here. Yeah, yeah, I'm back. I'm live. <laughs> okay. I'm John Eldridge, and this is Craig McConnell, and you have tuned in to the Ransomed Heart podcast. And we are really excited about what we're going to do here in January. We're going to take the next four weeks and devote them to a series on a new book that. Um, is coming out this week, in fact, called The Utter Relief of Holiness. Some of you Ransomed Heart friends will perhaps remember it as an audio series that we released a number of years ago. Initially, it was just a series of lectures that I did here at the Outpost and then uh, decided to turn it into a book, be able to add more content and, you know, develop some of the themes. And, And so The Utter Relief of Holiness, Craig? John. You had other topics, I'm sure. I mean, an author has so many books in him. There's two things I don't understand about your title or the book. Holiness? (laughs) What are you thinking? (laughs) Then the first part, relief, the utter relief. John, we need help here. Right. What are you writing about? Yeah, exactly. Um, Okay. First (laughs) off, the associations with the word holiness. Um, Let me go to Ephesians chapter 1. I love Eugene Peterson's translation in the message where he says, Long, long ago, God settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. What pleasure he took in planning this. And so Paul's kind of peeling back something of the curtain of time. And he's saying, look, I'm going to let you in. One of the deep major schemes of God in the human race. And the scheme is the intention, the plan, the directive, the motive, the goal is to make us whole and holy by his love. And here's the deal is I know a lot of people who are chasing wholeness. Particularly, I think if you hang out kind of in the ransomed heart world, we talk a lot about restoration and healing and um, the healing of the brokenhearted. And we believe in that and we experience it and celebrate it. But here's the thing. It almost seems like you have two camps right now in Christendom. You kind of have the wholeness camp. You have the people who are sort of chasing restoration. And then you have kind of the righteousness camp, you know, Mm -hmm. and the people are standing for traditional values or, you know, God's moral laws and upset about the decline of, of morality in the world. And the problem is this, is that actually you can't get to wholeness without holiness, And you can't get to holiness without wholeness. The two go together. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, why approaching, you know, the utter relief of holiness? First off, just the topic is because we're in a time where the saints are really being tested. The people of God are undergoing great trial. And I believe that it will continue and may in fact get worse. And your strength for this trial, the power that you bring to it, the secret of Jesus's powerful life is holiness. Mm -hmm. So you have these two groups of people. You have the serious people that are no fun to be around and are just unattractive. Those folks are seeking holiness or maturity. And then you have the the people emphasizing wholeness and they're running around. They're great to be with, but never seem to get there. Right. And you're writing a book 
to help us understand the life, the effect, what Christianity, its effect upon us. and Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's holiness. I know, I know, I know. All right. It's almost like you have to substitute the word goodness. The captivating goodness of Jesus. It's really one of the most, oh, resilient and breathtaking things about his life, his ability to handle power mm. and not let it corrupt him, his ability to navigate criticism and opposition, his ability to have intimate friendships Mm -hmm. with single women Mm. and have nothing else involved there, nothing awkward, you know, none of the fear, the confusion that enters into so many male-female relationships. I mean, the the captivating goodness of Jesus is what I mean, and, and it's what the scriptures mean by holiness. And here's the stunning thought, is that holiness is the healing of our humanity. Hmm. That is how God restores our lives, to make us whole and holy in his love. He gives to us the captivating goodness of Jesus. That's why it's so alluring, and and that's why it's an utter relief, Hmm. okay? You just take all those things that you struggle with. Think of all those things that um, cause you shame, guilt, remorse, regret, those things that you wake up thinking about in the night and think, what would it be like never to struggle with it again? Hmm. It would be Hmm. a relief. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And thus the title. Yeah. The utter relief of holiness. Yeah. When you say holiness, my mind just immediately goes to... I shouldn't be smoking. I shouldn't I know, be. I know. Shouldn't be drinking as much. But you're talking about something right. far deeper than just those external outward sin things. Yeah, 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 I know. I know. In fact, it's really pretty tragic how the connotations that most people have with the word holiness mm-hmm. now. You know, I, I get it. I understand it. I was sitting in church a number of years ago, and and the congregation was singing a song. Um, I think it's a Brian Dirksen song, Refiner's Fire. But the the lyrics go, you know, my heart's one desire is to be holy. <laughs> and I couldn't sing it. I, I, I just, I'm squirming in my seat. I just, I'm like, my heart's one desire? Like, I don't think it's on the radar. <laughs> and the reason is because, you know, we associate, you kind of hear the word holiness and you think hard, boring, you know austere, you you think, giving up, what, music, movies, dancing, you know, you you think of something very dry. Yeah. People hear the word holiness and and we think, you know, I've got to give up, you know, drinking, dancing, going to movies. We hear it as something very dry and austere, something like, you know. Yeah, and I've been there, and I've done that, and I've failed, and and you're going to put that yeah, on me. Right. There's no life in that. There's no joy. There's no hope, happiness. And mm-hmm. Okay, so again, pause and just substitute the captivating goodness mm-hmm. of Jesus. Like Craig, you've read mm-hmm. parts of the book now. Mm-hmm. What was your reaction? Um, inviting, surprising. The book felt like an invitation to come into a room, a party, into a fellowship that um, that I've never been invited to or never thought I would attend. You made holiness both um, practical, very attractive, and just stirred up longing for more, the longing for more. I think... I think, John, I think I'm good at yearning for God, but what does that look like? What does that mean? And you kind of put words to that yearning for God has an effect, and it looks like this, goodness Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or holiness. So, um, yeah, my reading of the book was like an invitation to a part of life that I felt like I was inaccessible. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Attractive, alluring, yeah. and, and also powerful. My heart in writing this book is to strengthen 
mm-hmm. to strengthen our friends, to strengthen the people of God. Um, most of our listeners will recall the story of the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. It takes place early in the Gospels. In Luke, it takes place in chapter 4. Right after Jesus is baptized, um, he's led mm-hmm. by the Spirit out into the wilderness and and he undergoes this great ordeal, this great testing of his character. But what I want to point out is, is what happens afterwards. Afterwards, it says, Jesus returned full of the power mm. of the Spirit of God. That everyone wants to live a powerful life. Everyone wants to feel like my life matters. Yes. I'm having an impact in this world. You know, I'm changing things. I'm bringing compassion or love or justice, uh, reconciliation, redemption, beauty, life, love. I, you know, I'm, my life matters. And friends, here's the secret. The secret to Jesus' powerful life is his holiness, his goodness, his trueness, his beauty, you know, what his character, what makes him him. And, and then as you begin to look at that, you actually see it sort of shimmering through all of the stories in the scriptures, whether it's, you know, the woman at the well or the confrontation with the Pharisees, you know, even right down to his crucifixion. You just see this shining goodness coming through, which is not a performance. It's literally the strength yes. of his life. And so that that's my heart in writing this. I want to strengthen the people of God. So what we're going to do today and over the next three podcasts, the next three weeks after this one, we're about to give you a taste right now. We're going to excerpt the audio book, me here in the studio reading through some of the highlights of The Utter Relief of Holiness. And so that'll be the rest of today's podcast. And then in the next three weeks, we'll offer some more of the highlights. And friends, I think you're going to be surprised. I think you're going to love it. Yeah. An Utter Relief. One of the strangest quirks of our life here on this planet is the fact that the one face we hardly ever see is the one closest to us, our own. As we move about in the world every day, our face is always right before us and always just beyond us. Somebody could write a fairy tale about that. It would be an allegory for how rarely we see ourselves, who we truly are, the good and the bad. But in unexpected moments, we get a sideways glance as when passing by a plate glass window downtown, and most of the time, we don't like much what we see. Notice how we are in elevators. No one makes eye contact. No one wants to acknowledge that we are seeing and being seen. In a moment of forced intimacy, almost claustrophobic intimacy, we pretend we aren't even there. The reason? Most times, we just don't know what to do with what we see. About ourselves, I mean. It doesn't take a Nobel Prize winner to know that something dreadful has happened to the human race. So we stare at the ceiling or our shoes. We watch the numbers report the passing floors. We hide. This is how most of us approach our entire lives. We hide what we can, work on what we feel is redeemable, and despise the rest. There is a better way. The first chapter of Khaled Husseini's novel, Kite Runner, begins with an arresting sentence. I became what I am today, at the age of twelve, on a frigid, overcast day in the winter of 1975. It is the beginning of a confession. He continues, I remember the precise moment, crouching behind a crumbling mud wall, peeking into the alley near the frozen creek. That was a long time ago, but it's wrong what they say about the past I've learned about how you can bury it, because the past claws its way out. Looking back now, I realize I have been peeking into that deserted alley for the last 26 years. One day last summer, my friend Rahim Khan called me from Pakistan. He asked me to come see him. Standing in the kitchen with the receiver to my ear, I knew it wasn't just Rahim Khan on the line. It was my past of unatoned sins. Oh my, what if your past of unatoned sins called you on the phone one day? How would you feel? What would you say? He goes on. I sat on a park bench near a willow tree. 
I thought about something, Rahim Khan said, just before he hung up, almost as an afterthought. There is a way to be good again. I looked up at those twin kites. I thought about Hassan, thought about Baba, Ali, Kabul. I thought of the life I had lived until the winter of 1975 came along and changed everything and made me what I am today. Every one of us could write a similar confession. That is, if we saw things clearly, we too could say, this is what I am today. This is what has made me what I am today. But my favorite line in the entire novel is this one, there is a way to be good again. Whether you are aware of it or not, you crave goodness. In the depths of your being, you ache for goodness. We all do. Our souls long for a sense of wholeness, and goodness is essential for wholeness. We are made for goodness like we are made to breathe, like we are made to love. Goodness is the strength of our condition. And friends, you are going to need a deep and profound goodness for all that is coming at you like a freight train. And there is a way to be good again. It comes to us from such a surprising direction, as almost all the answers to our deepest needs do, that we'd best begin with a question. What is Christianity supposed to do to a person? How God Restores Human Beings We exercise because we want to grow stronger. We take vitamins in the hope of being healthy. We attend language classes expecting to learn a new language. We travel for adventure. We work in the hope of prospering. We love partly in the hope of being loved. So why Christianity? What is the effect Christianity is intended to have upon a person who becomes a Christian, seeks to live as a Christian? The way you answer that question is mighty important. Your beliefs about this will shape your convictions about nearly everything else. It will shape your understanding of the purpose of the gospel. It will shape your understanding of what you believe God is up to in a person's life. The way you answer this one question will shape your thoughts about church and community, service, justice, prayer, and worship. It is currently shaping the way you interpret your experiences and your beliefs about your relationship with God. So, what is Christianity supposed to do to a person? Listen to Paul in Ephesians chapter 1. How blessed is God and what a blessing he is. He's the Father of our Master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in him. Long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love, to make you whole and holy by his love. Whole and holy. This is what you ache for, at least, you ache for the wholeness part. The holy part seems mm, optional, but you will soon see why it is not. Whole and holy, this is your destiny. And once the truth of it seizes you, you'll run around the house whooping at the sheer promise. Now, we probably all have some idea what wholeness might look like, might at least feel like, but what about the holy part? It almost seems like a disconnect summer vacation, and clean your room, gelato, and Brussels sprouts. What does this have to do with that? For years, I thought of holiness as something austere, spiritually elite, and frankly, rather severe. Giving up worldly pleasures, innocent things like sugar or music or fishing, living an entirely spiritual life, praying a lot, being a very good person, something that only very old saints attain. In fact, do a little exercise right now. What comes to mind when you read or hear the word holiness, that is, as it applies to human beings? What are your unspoken assumptions about holiness? This book emerged out of a series of talks I gave to a live audience, and at this point, I asked them what came to their minds when they heard the word holiness. These are their words. Boring. Denial, as in self-denial. Discipline, unattainable, striving, the goal, separation as in from the world or that sort of thing, hard. 
I don't think they are an exception. Their response is completely understandable and heartbreaking. Holiness is not exactly a hot item these days, in great part because we've come to associate all sorts of crushing and unattainable things with it. Yet in order to make human beings what they are meant to be, the love of God seeks to make us whole and holy. In fact, the assumption of the New Testament is that you cannot become whole without becoming holy, nor can you become holy without becoming whole. The two go hand in hand. Perhaps there is a rescue waiting for us if we can escape our misunderstandings of what Christianity is supposed to do to a person and the role of holiness in that. The purpose of God is restoring the creation he made. That is what Christianity is supposed to do to a person, restore them as a human being. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see that original and intended shape of our lives there in him. After God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. And after he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then, after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he had begun. From Romans 8. From the very beginning, God decided to shape our lives along a certain line. The intended shape of our existence is made clear in the person of Jesus. It is a massive undertaking. And notice that it requires restoration. The Son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. Thus, the healing of the whole man. That's the purpose of Christianity. Well, hope you enjoyed this first of four series of podcasts on John's new book, The Utter Relief of Holiness. And the excerpt we took from actually from chapter one of that book. I know that that chapter, that reading just leaves me just longing for the restoration of who God intended me to be as a man, whole and holy. If you'd like to get this new book by John, The Utter Relief of Holiness, it's now available through bookstores and our website here at ransomedheart.com. Look forward to having you join us next week as we continue this series on the utter relief of holiness.